Hey gang, welcome to Time in the Market, the investing channel with a long-term focus. Today, I'm going to take a look at Cracker Barrel. This is an American chain of restaurants and gift stores with a southern country theme. They have about 660 locations as of 2023. They've been around for quite some time, um, so this is a company that's stood the test of time, but is facing some issues right now as inflation heats up, as some of their margins are pressured. They are a high-yield company, especially at today's prices, yielding about 7.5%, so I'm going to take a look at whether their dividend is safe. Uh, what their stock price looks like, how it's performed, the financials, and then do a quick valuation to see if I'm interested at all in the stock. As always, guys, if you like these videos, hit the like button, subscribe, all of that good stuff. Welcome to everybody who has done that in the last couple of weeks. I'm glad you're enjoying the videos. And always let me know what you feel about the stock in question, what stocks you want me to cover, etc. So let's dive right into it. So this is an investor presentation from January, a bit de uh, dated, but again, I think it gives a good overview of what the company is about. These guys own two brands, Cracker Barrel Old Country Store and Maple Street Biscuit Company, which they acquired in 2019. The majority of their stores are Cracker Barrel. Uh, Maple Street Biscuit is relatively new, more focused on the breakfast, lunch, brunch type stuff, whereas Cracker Barrel is a restaurant slash old general store in one. So what they basically do is Southern comfort food on the restaurant side, and then the general store that's attached to it will sell, you know, kind of gift items with stuff that represents the 50s and 60s, vehicles, puzzles, woodcrafts, country music, uh, old TV, DVDs, cookbooks, uh, and decor in a big way, a lot of Christmas stuff around Christmas, etc. It's very themed at times. And then brands of candy, snack foods, stuff like that. So it's it's very specialized. Some people like it, some people don't. They have a lot of locations all around the United States. Like I said, 665 company-owned stores. 20% of that is retail revenue. The rest comes from the restaurants in questions. Kind of, You can kind of see who actually goes to these places. It's a relatively multi-generational clientele. And breakfast, lunch, and dinner are about equally split, more focused on lunch and dinner. Although I think they've been growing pretty well in the breakfast side, especially with the addition of the Biscuit Company. And you can kind of see where their locations are. Really focused on the south, southeast, a little bit into the north. Uh, the west is kind of underpenetrated right now, but maybe potentially that area just doesn't love southern <laughs> comfort food. Um, but I, I suppose there's some opportunity for growth there. A lot of these openings are kind of like, if you look at California, they've really only started opening stores in 2010 onwards. So potentially some opportunity there. Uh, and then Maple Street, which is a, a restaurant chain that they acquired not too long ago. I think they acquired it for about $38 million or something like there. Serves more breakfast-oriented, lunch-oriented, brunch-oriented fare. And from what I've gathered, the reviews there are pretty good. You know, one of the things you want to do when you invest in a restaurant concept is to see how people actually like the food if you've never been yourself. I've actually never been to a Cracker Barrel myself, but I know people who have gone to it, and they like it for a variety of reasons. It's just comfortable. It's relatively cheap, um, although we'll talk about whether it's cheap these days in relation to other costs and whether or not that's impacting their revenue and growth strategy but that's from a from a you know it's on the lower end of the cost scale compared to some other places um talking about some other stuff blah 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 or digital marketing unit growth how how much they've they've grown here you can kind of see that uh, the biscuit company is becoming a bigger part of their growth story. They're opening more of those than they are Cracker Barrels at this point. For example, in 2023, expectations are you're adding about 14 of the biscuit places and only three Cracker Barrels, maybe four Cracker Barrels on the high end. So clearly they know that maybe they're a bit saturated on the Cracker Barrel side and want to open the other concept and see how that does. Um, clearly doing pretty well for them if they're growing it relatively quickly. Um, one thing to look at this company uh, is their financials. That's really important. As always, all of these restaurant places were killed during the pandemic. And you can kind of see here how that's going. That comparable restaurant sales basically fell off a cliff in 2020, uh, continued to fall in 2021, and then really ticked back up in 2022. Uh, so that's not surprising uh, what it'll be important to see if how they actually managed to survive the pandemic. Um, and obviously they did. Uh, but the stock price is essentially back close to pandemic close. So we'll see what's driving that. Uh, this is a business that generated strong cash flows 
historically and continues to do so into 2022. Even 2020, they show positive free cash flow, although that excludes about 200 million in purchase of property and equipment uh, that's related to the sale and leaseback transactions. So basically how they survived the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, they sold some of their locations and leased them back to some company. They basically made, you know, we said, hey, here's 65 of our locations. We're going to give you the ownership of those locations and we'll just become tenants. So instead of ownership of the building, then I have capital leases on the books. Uh, it's a good way to raise money, especially since one of the things they did is they actually signed rents that were below what they would have been paying before on these locations. So didn't seem like that a bad idea at the time. And they still own a good majority of their locations. As far as I know, they only sold about 130 in these sale leaseback transactions between 2020 and 2021. And they obviously used some of that money to survive the poor growth or negative, negative growth during the pandemic and also to buy back shares, uh, continue issuing the dividend or grow the dividend past the uh, pandemic. Um, they have a certain capital allocation that they stick to. They obviously reinvest in the business to grow. Uh, they continue to develop new units. They return capital to shareholders through a dividend, which is relatively compelling at this point. If that's what you're into, the question is whether or not they can maintain it. And then a share repurchase program. They will cut the dividend when needed. This is not a company that's got a dividend track record that's spotless. In 2020, they cut the dividend to zero for a bit. 2021, that continued. Then they brought it back after the pandemic was over and they were kind of growing again. So makes sense to do that when you're a company. I actually like seeing something like that. Hey, when things are bad and your free cash flow is positioned to not cover the dividend, making you have to actually borrow to fund a dividend, uh, especially where rates are today, probably not a great idea to continue the dividend. So cutting it makes sense from a long-term perspective. Some investors don't like that. I don't mind it if it helps the company grow in the long run, right? Uh, that's the major concern here and you can kind of see the dividend and where they were they do issue special dividends from time to time when the free cash flows are very very nice as you saw between 2016 and 2019 that didn't happen 2022 onwards but you can kind of see that the dividend actually dropped in 2020 dropped continued to drop in 2021 and then rose again in 2022 when they reinstituted it and now they pay a one dollar thirty cent dividend per quarter so was, why is the stock down as much as it is well they just had their q4 earnings for 2023 continued to declare that 130 dividend showed that growth was there with total revenue increasing at 0.8 percent driven by 2.4 percent increases in comparable restaurant sales and a 6.8 percent decrease in retail sales with margins in the 4.9 percent range now we'll look at what that means but those margins are shrinking and the main problem is that they're shrinking for reasons that might not end anytime soon. And the second problem and why the stock is down um, a little bit more is that their financials are starting to look a bit more questionable than they used to because of those shrinking margins. So let's cover the shrinking margins in the first place. One, yes, they had 2.4% comparable sale increased for Q4, but the majority of that came from an 8.7% increase in menu pricing, which is done to offset some of the cost pressure that they've experienced in the last couple of years. The problem with that is, yes, you're growing at 2.4%, but if 8, 9% of that comes from menu pricing, that means volume was down a little bit. That is a bit of a problem. Margin is at 4.9% here, which is off of their historical highs that were in that 7 to 8% range maybe even higher at times. And a lot of that is due to cost pressures. They're seeing pressure on the commodity side, meaning they have to pay more money for all of the stuff that they sell and all of the ingredients that are used in the restaurant. And they're also seeing pressure on the wage side. Their employees are demanding a higher salary. They need a higher salary to survive. Um, and obviously when you're dealing with a margin, with a relatively low margin business like a restaurant, that is going to pressure your margins. And what you can do to offset that is to raise menu prices. But the problem for Cracker Barrel is that they attract a more lower middle income um, consumer than some other restaurants. And when you start seeing the value proposition of your restaurant get worse, you know, they're claiming that even though their prices are up 
17 to 20 percent since 2021 on the menu side people still see them as a good value how long is that going to continue when people have a ton of pressures on the cost side everywhere their rents are up the groceries are up um, other costs are up essentially non-discretionary costs are up are discretionary costs going to hold up are they going to able be able to pass through all of these increases to make their margins at what they've historically been or are their margins at their new normal is this what they're going to face for the next couple of years and or forever and what does that mean for their dividend what does that mean for their cash flow etc it's a bit of a problem and that's why the market is pricing the stock where it's pricing it now and the other problem that they essentially said is that this isn't stopping anytime soon when you look at their first quarter 2024 outlook their growth is kind of anemic they're opening up a couple more stores they are saying they're going to see commodity deflation for the first time but wage inflation is still going to be four to five percent and what that means is we're going from a q4 margin of you know 4.9 percent down to one and a half to two and a half percent now that's a big gap one thing to note is that q1 margin for them is always lower it's always pressured for one reason or another but even last year when margins were already being pressured q1 came in around 2.9 percent so you're going from 2.9 percent to anywhere between 1.5 to 2.5 percent so if you're an investor looking at a company that's seeing their margins pressured you're only being told that that's going to continue and if you listen to their earnings call there wasn't you know much about that changing anytime soon certainly their long-term goal is to get back to margins that they saw prior to that pandemic but it's going to be it's going to be hard for them like i said this is a chain that that attracts a certain type of consumer and if that consumer is already pressured on the financial side is cracker barrel going to be able to push through more and more and more uh, menu increases. Now, there's certainly some value here. They talked about their 8.99 breakfast, all of that stuff, that are still a great value to attract consumers to make them shop at their stores, all of that stuff. But as investors, we're not seeing that right now. So let's look at those financials in more detail. And we kind of talked about their prices already. Let's look at their net income margins and kind of what I'm talking about. This is a company that saw margins in that three and a half to 4% range for quite some time, but then did a good job to improve those margins prior to the pandemic. And that's where the stock was starting to get rewarded, where margins were in that six to seven to eight to almost 9% range. Now, maybe the expectations are that this was going to continue maybe that's why the price point was in that 165 dollars share before per share before the pandemic hit obviously during the pandemic the margins dropped to negatives then they did a good job of bouncing back but that was during the year when people were like let's go spend money so they were able to really push their margins as far as they could then as interest rates rose and they have a little bit of debt to deal with and that's going to increase their debt costs as people started to get pressured on the discretionary side margins fell down to four percent down to two percent and they're falling even further going into the next quarter and maybe that's going to continue going forward and that's a bit of a problem and it's a bit of a problem for a couple of reasons one if you look at their balance sheet it's not bad by any means it's still reasonable they only have about 414 million dollars in debt versus 702 million in capital leases but it could be a problem if their free cash flow isn't able to handle the dividend that they're paying plus the additional interest they may have from the debt rolling over and or simply the ability to pay down that debt on a go forward basis plus any you know stock purchases they may want to make are out of the question if that's the case you can kind of look at this company this is a relatively low market cap company at this point you're talking about 1.5 billion in market cap with an additional 1 billion in in essentially debt net debt uh on a net debt over ebitda basis and again ebitda is being pressured because of lower margins it's at 3x which is a bit higher than you want to typically see on something like this you're talking probably them targeting two and a half or lower uh, for a company this size so they're a bit above that their goal would be to pay that down uh, to improve that a little bit and obviously on the other end <laughs> on the divider increase EBITDA um, if you look at cash flow and where their money is actually going you can see the other problem that investors face when they look at this company they pay a pretty sizable dividend it's about a seven and a half percent yield at today's prices that's 116 million per year or so 
if they don't cut it like they did in 21 and 2020. Um, and that is just shy of their free cash flow. And that's a free cash flow that, you know, maybe has better margins that they're going to see in the coming year. Um, if you look at the year prior to that, they paid 114 million in dividends versus 106 million in free cash flow. So their payout ratio is essentially close to or above 100% on a free cash flow basis. Um, that's on top of any debt they may want to repay. If they want to repay it, they paid, you know, 10 million, which is essentially all of their free cash flow. Um, and they essentially had to use some of their cash on the books to buy back the little shares that they may want to buy back. And if their stock is being pressured right now because of lower margins, then they don't feel like that's the norm going forward. Maybe their goal would be to buy back some shares, but they really can't do that right now because they don't have the free cash flow to support it because they pay a massive dividend. So is there a chance that a dividend cut is coming here? I think so. I think they are certainly not going to want to do that because right now, you know, their dividend is covered by their free cash flow. But if there's any further margin pressure, if there is any sort of slowdown in the economy that pushes down to tr discretionary spending, um, that is going to be a bit of a problem for them because they're, they're right on the cusp, right? They're right on the cusp. And yes, they could take on more debt, but as a small company, their debt's going to have a relatively high interest uh, payment that goes along with it. And that's probably not what they want to do from a long-term perspective. They've always been relatively uh, debt free. Um, you know, obviously they took out some money in 2020. Uh, they paid that down pretty quickly by doing some sale leasebacks. But I think their goal is to not have as much debt on the books as they do right now. Uh, it wasn't as much of a problem in the last couple of decades or a decade or so when interest rates were super low. But now that interest rates have gone up five to 6%, it's, it's a bit of a problem for a company like Cracker Barrel because that is going to weigh on their results. If we look at the estimates, the estimates are essentially saying growth is going to be anemic in, on a go forward basis. You're basically not getting that much growth out of this company. You can kind of go back to 2016 when they had far less stores. They didn't have that biscuit company um, on their books. They had about three billion in revenue. Well, they're just at 3.4 billion, 3.5 billion, you know, almost seven to eight years later. So relatively low growth there. And the problem is that margins have gone in the wrong direction. EBITDA margins from 12% in 2016 down to 6.9% in 2023. Uh, free cash flow margins in that 7% range, slightly negative here, in that 7% range down to 3%. And, you know, the estimates here are showing 6%, but that's probably unlikely given that there's one estimate, so it's not very believable. And then net income margins have gone from six down to three to four percent in the last couple of years. So certainly margin pressure, certainly a problem for a company like this one. And with the dividend being as high as it is, the question for investors would be, well, the majority of this investment value in the last 10 years have has come from the dividend. I haven't really done anything in terms of share price. In fact, I'm on the negative side as an investor in terms of share price. So if they cut the dividend, what is the end result from an investment perspective? Now, the other side of things, as we look at the valuation, is that the value right now is relatively interesting. Um, I'm assuming 2% growth for the next couple of years in my sheet here. I'm assuming margins that start at 3.2%, which is kind of realistic based on what they said in the Q1 projections, slightly worse than what actually happened in 23, and then maybe improving up to 4%, which is sort of around their historical norms prior to those highs of 2016. Um, Right now, the market's valuing this at an 8.13% free cash flow yield for a variety of reasons that we talked about before. My scenarios kind of have them hanging out mostly in that range, 90% in the 7 to 9% free cash flow yield range, and then slight improvement into the 6% free cash flow yield uh, on the upside. There's a 7.5% dividend tied to this, and then I'm targeting a return of 10% in this workup. That gives me a fair value of 56 bucks versus a $69 current price. So that's, that looks bad. And it, it does. But you must also remember that if you're a believer in the dividend, if you don't think they're going to cut it, um, this is probably understating the actual fair value of the company because I'm actually saying that I need a 17.5% return for this to work for me as an investment. So if you think the dividend's safe, um, and I, I don't. I think in the next five years, they're, if their margins don't recover, they're going to cut the dividend, which is why I'm targeting a return that's more than 10%, which is why I'm saying that 
I'm probably not targeting 17.5% because I think the dividend is going to be at least partially reduced in the next couple of years in order for them to pay off their debt, in order for them to potentially buy back shares instead of paying a dividend. Um, if you do feel like the dividend is safe, though, you can probably target something like 7% or 6%, which puts you at a you know 6 plus 7.5% overall return. And you kind of get it to a fair value that's close to where you are now, um, which means that the price is probably fair if the dividend is safe or even decent because if you go to 5%, fair value is 70 bucks. If you go to 4%, the fair value is 74 bucks, so on and so forth. Um, but let's go back to 10% and let's kind of look at the upside of this company. I think that's where the investment thesis would lie here is that right now the margins are compressed, suppressed, whatever. Growth isn't going to be there, but you don't need growth to be there for this to be a good investment. You just need there to be margin recovery you can either see growth at zero and still make out okay at this investment because of where it's priced if you somehow get to a six percent margin in 2028 this suddenly becomes an amazing investment because one your dividend is covered so you're safe there if the recovery comes faster you're safe there they are right now still covering their debt payments and their dividend with their free cash flow or close to it. For example, in 2024, I have about 112 million in free cash flow estimated, a dividend total of about 115 million. So they're not really sinking right now as long as margins stay at 3.2% or above, they're still in an okay spot. So they can kind of float along and wait for margin recovery. And when margin recovery happens, even if they're not raising their dividend, which I'm assuming they won't here, they are looking at, you know, money in excess of that dividend that they can use to pay down more debt to buy back shares, et cetera. And if the margin recovery is faster than I'm showing here, the upside could be very substantial, right? Even if you get to a 6% margin by 2028, you're talking about a 8% to 37% return, depending on how the market values this. Now, it's probably not going to value it at the 3 to 5% free cash flow yields, but even if you're sticking at the you know, nine, six to nine percent range, you're talking anywhere from 10 to 19 percent returns. And that's prior to the dividend. If you go after the dividend, you're talking, you know, 15 to 23 percent. Now, that obviously assumes that there's margin recovery in there. But if you believe that this is a smoking deal right now, if you believe that there's margin recovery that's going to happen in the next couple of years, if you believe that the strategy of pushing through higher menu increases is going to pay dividends. They're not going to lose a lot of volume. They're going to be able to increase margins. Wage inflation is eventually going to stop. One of their selling points is, you know, good hospitality, et cetera. In order to do that, you need to pay your employees well or they'll go elsewhere, at least talented ones will. So there's some pressure on the wage inflation side that is going to continue. But if you think that's going to abate in the next couple of years, um, if you think they're going to be able to um, weather any sort of recession relatively well. Again, this is a, a lower cost restaurant than some others. You can probably go back to their financials and sort of go back to 2008 and see how they fared during that period. Didn't see a huge drop. They did relatively well during the last recession, essentially flat between 2008 and 2010. Uh, on the net income side, they were actually positive. So that's something. That's another good data point that says, well, this is a company that's done well during a crisis where everybody was doing poorly because when they wanted to go out, they went out to a relatively cheap place and Cracker Barrel fills that void. Now, the question is, are they going to fill that void five years from now if their menu prices are going up another 20%? Now, the obvious argument would be, well, other restaurants are doing the same. Yes, but maybe people will just eat in more and restaurants are kind of boned because the value proposition just isn't there anymore. Once you start going to a place and it's like, well, I'm paying $28 for a burger, that sucks. Uh, maybe I just won't get burgers anymore. That is certainly an anti-restaurant argument across the board, but it's not one that's hit Cracker Barrel yet. Um, we're starting to see some of that in their margin compression but potentially that recovers. So if you believe that this is a margin recovery story and margins are going to recover to 6%, maybe even higher if you go to 7%, this is massive. This could potentially be, you know, a stock that's back to 160 bucks at that spot. You know, you're essentially saying that by if you get to 7% margins, this is a stock that's, you know, at 150 bucks plus the dividend you get 
from a $69 current price point, uh, pretty good returns there. Now, my question would be, what if it doesn't happen? This isn't necessarily an industry I want to be in in a big way. So for me, I'm just saying, what's the the negative side of things? And I think the negative side of things is one, they cut the dividend. They see margin pressure in the short term that fall. That means their cash flow is below their dividend. That means they're not able to buy back shares at all. That means they're not pay, able to pay, pay back debt at all. And maybe they want to be a bit more conservative and say, well, we're going to cut our dividend. And instead of paying a dividend or, or at least, you know, paying such a large dividend, we're going to use that to pay down debt. We're going to use that to buy back more shares at the press prices. And from a long-term perspective, that's a good thing for investors. From a short-term perspective, it might not be. It might cause further pain in the stock price, especially if people are in the stock for the dividend alone, uh, because that's really what's been driving returns in the last couple of years. Now, if they do that, I'd actually probably be more interested in the stock because I would like their balance sheet a bit more then. I think this is a very low market cap company that has a lot of potential if they can recover their margins to at least half of what they used to be. You know, I'm not talking that 4% is their top end. If 4% is their top end, I probably need a bit more than today's prices. But if they get to 5, 6, 7%, 7% would be amazing, but 6%, the returns here are going to be really, really good. And I can see why people would might want to make the investment here. Now, the downside is their margins are crap for a long, long time. And if that's the case, then you need a price that's probably, you know, 20% below where it is today, like I'm showing here. And you also need their dividend to be definitely cut because they're not going to be able to sustain 115 million in dividend payments when their cash flow is starting to be, you know, below that and maybe even hitting below 100 million, depending on what, where their margins go. So that's my thoughts on Cracker Bell. Kind of a good investment idea. Um, I can see why people are buying it here. I am not myself, but I'm going to keep a close eye on this. I'm going to set a price point that's probably close to that $57 range. If it hits that, I'm going to be very interested. I'm probably going to buy some shares and kind of wait it out and see what happens because I think there's a story here to be told where this could be an amazing compounder from today's price point. It hasn't been since 2010 or something like that, right? It really hasn't been. If you've been an investor in this for a while, it hasn't been a good investment, but that doesn't mean it can't be a good investment going forward, right? The story has to turn around though. If margins get better, this will be a good investment. If margins stay compressed and don't get better, this stock is going to kind of meander around where it is now. Maybe you'll get a dividend, maybe they'll cut it, um, but it wouldn't be something that I'd be super interested in. And that's why I need a lower price point that, I, that, I, that I'm getting today because I need this to be a really smoking investment because the idea of just restaurants isn't all that enticing to me. I rarely ever invest in restaurants. I rarely ever invest in, in a retail restaurant concept. So in order for me to do that, I'd have to be really intrigued. And you know, if this stock was trading at $56 today, I'd be really intrigued. But if it's trading at $70 today, I'm like, eh, it seems okay. It just needs to change. And uh, I don't want to make a bet on that change until the price point gets really, really interesting. And for me, that would be basically a 10% target return, which would give me a fair value of 56 bucks. So let me know what you guys think about Cracker Barrel. If you agree, if you disagree, if you think the dividend is safe or not, um, but we'll see. Thanks for watching. As always, guys, I'm not a qualified financial advisor. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment decisions. If you like the video, hit the like button. If you want to see more, subscribe. Uh, I'll be around making a bunch of these videos. And if you want to see any specific companies covered, I usually try to cover companies that are doing something in the news, earnings, whatever. Uh, but I'll also do stuff that's outside of that time frame as well if the company interests me um so thanks for watching have a good rest of your day